Good morning, everyone. Uh, the objective of this talk today is to promote a dialogue on best practice methodologies of using portable XRF. There's a lot of there's, there's a lot of XRF users in the room here today. Um, British Geological Survey had about three instruments. Campbell School of Mine, Oxford University, Cardiff University, Brighton University. Uh, I've been down the Great Dyke with uh, platinum miners looking at nickel and copper as a pathfinder on the face underground. Um, portable XRF has been used for yttrium as a pathfinder for project, rare earth projects in Tanzania that we mentioned. Also in uh, Namibia, Namibian rare earths have been doing some really interesting things with yttrium as a proxy for heavy rare earths. Um, various explorers and miners in, in southwest England have portable XRFs and also lead zinc, platinum explorers and miners in Ireland. The lightest element that portable XRF can measure is magnesium and the heaviest is around about uranium. The heavy, the heavy rare earths are very difficult for portable XRF but the lanthium, cerium, praseodymium, neodymium suite is, is not so difficult. But yttrium at the end of the day is the best element for a pathfinder for rare earths in my experience. Olympus do portable XRFs which, which provide chemical analysis, elemental analysis which gives a chemistry, quantitative chemi chemistry on the screen <coughs> and we also do portable X-ray diffraction systems uh, giving mineralogy and a diffraction pattern which, which needs a little bit more interpretation. So this is just an example of some of our customers around the world who are using portable XRFs. There's a lot of suppliers of portable XRFs. There's a range of suppliers, so you should do your due diligence and have a look at what's out there on the market. And they would have a range of their customers as well, but most of them are using them for all different applications. Mineral exploration, grade control, in the mill for environmental applications, and also for testing alloys and metals. So why do people use XRF? It's non-destructive, it's fast, it's portable and it's quantitative. And you can genuinely save millions of dollars using this technology. What are the limitations? Well, it's a combination of XRF technology and the type of samples that we're testing. The limits of detection of portable XRFs aren't as good as laboratories. It's not a sub PPM technique. And, and when you start to get down to 5 PPM, 5 grams per tonne, it starts to get difficult. <coughs> A weakness of XRF is that it's affected by variations in matrix. So different geological <coughs> chemistries start uh, giving you different results. So you test an oxide, you test a sulphide, you test a carbonate. It may have 10% copper in it, for example. The instrument might give you different readings. That's XRF technology. It's not portable XRF. That's a limitation of X-ray fluorescence, whether it's a lab-based system or a portable-based system. But the big challenge to effectively using these instruments in the field is homogeneity, sample preparation. The measurement window of this, these tools is about one square centimetre. So whatever you place in front of that one square centimetre is going to be measured. And that's, that's the challenge. There's also issues associated with the XRF spectrum. And there's a lot of spectral overlaps. The instrument's measuring peaks on an energy spectrum and then converting those to parts per million or percent. And there are some inherent spectral overlaps that can cause problems. One example is uh, large iron peaks covering a cobalt peak, uh, large zinc peaks covering gold peaks. Not that uh, it's recommended to use XRF for measuring gold, but it exists. Uh, selenium, tungsten, platinum, uh, zinc, they all overlap in this quite uh, crowded area of the spectrum over gold. In my experience, the main problem relates to human beings, how well they've been trained and, and their experience, and whether they've thought about applying a systematic methodology to what they're doing. There's also a lack of global standard operating procedures around the world. The Canadian Mineral Industry Research Organisation, the Australian Institute of Geoscientists, have started some forums to try and uh, address that issue. 
I also think that we as XRF suppliers have a part to play and could do a lot better in terms of training our distributor, uh, our, our customers. We have a five strong minerals team of, of people who have a lot of expertise, but we also have distributors in, in different countries who don't have that same level of expertise. So if you buy an instrument in, in Argentina or Bolivia, a rep down there might not have the same experience as, as one, one of our distributors in Australia, for example. So we need to be better about standardising our training. How experienced is, is the supplier of the XRF we purchase? Uh, internal training within companies, often companies buy an XRF and then a geologist leaves and he'll give a 10 minute training to the next geo who's going to take that, analyse or run with it. And also the, uh, the, the senior geologist's uh, oversight of a junior. A senior geologist may have a responsibility for that XRF program and the methodology. Uh, but it's, it comes down to the junior geologist who's got to put that in practice and, and implement it. The good is generally characterised by a methodology set up that's fit for purpose. And if you want to set up a methodology that's fit for purpose, then you need to consider what the XRF will be used to do and clarify some aims and objectives of, of the use of that for XRF. What accuracy and precision do you really need to make the decisions that you need to make? Um, if you're doing early stage reconnaissance, often relative anomalies are good enough. You only need to be looking for high, medium and low. You don't need lab quality accuracy. But if you're in a grade control scenario, you do. So you need to understand or, or clarify to yourself what your aims and objectives are. And, and this methodology, there's a lot of different things that you need to consider. An orientation survey at the beginning uh, of acquiring SRF. How does the instrument's factory calibration perform? Optimising its test time, the homogeneity sample prep, QAQC, running blanks and standards as part of your protocols, which mode do you use on the analyzer, which elements? This is a uh, case study done by Phoenix Copper where they said they saved a million dollars in assay costs in 12 months using affordable XRF. This company, ABM Resources, uh, this is their case study where they saved 900,000 Australian dollars in two years. This is some work SRK did in Russia where they've identified a copper anomaly in soil very easily. This is work I did in Andacoyo in, in uh, Chile showing the quality of the data you can produce for grade control application on pulps. <coughs> this is some European uh, a, a copper prospect exploration project in Europe where we're testing diamond core doing 10 readings per metre and taking an average of those. And whilst the graphs don't, uh, they're not exactly the same like as the, the previous slide, it's, it's clear that if you want to select your sampling intervals for this bit of core, you're going to take the first four, four or five readings and, and the last three readings, those sample intervals are the ones that you're going to send to the lab. Portable exotropes now explicitly reference in, table, in the Table 1 report template, the new jaw code. Handheld XRF instruments are referred to in the sampling techniques section and ironically in the quality of assay data and laboratory tests section. Here's some good and bad, this is some gold results um, on certified reference materials which are interference free. This is our latest and greatest analyzers. I'm not suggesting that we should be using XRF for gold but we were just doing some internal work to see how good it was performing. And this is the quality of the data this is XRF, this is that, that we can achieve in an interference free matrix. And this is an example of a bad where XRF can produce false positives in the presence on gold in the presence of zinc and arsenic because of these spectral overlap issues. This is a company running QC sample as part of their pro program and relatively stable after calibration. This is pre calibration, they've calibrated it. And this is the bad. What's happening here? Why is this instrument outside the plus or minus 20% acceptable limits? So it's a good aspect and a bad aspect. This is a company's uh, ASX report which discusses handheld XRF with no detail whatsoever about how they've used it, the methodology they've used. Here's an example of some poor cobalt data on pulps from a recent project I did. The data it just doesn't look very good at all. And it's highly likely it's because of high iron in that, in that particular 
project. So we're currently addressing that. In the other, this is it, to finish off. Um, on the 13th of the recent month, in an ASX announcement, a company stated that significant copper gold stock work was discovered and they reported these results in their announcement. Um, gold at 17 grams per tonne is reported by the SRF, a handful of SRF. Uh, and they even stated, and the results are expected to under-report. In the same announcement, they released this data for rock chip samples with this, these gold results for handheld XRF. Now, when I see that, the first thing I do is look at zinc. And if you look at the really high 132 grams per tonne gold reading, that's 2% zinc. When I saw that, I knew straight away that this is going to be false positives. I can't wait to see the, the lab data. On the 18th, there was a clarification and a retraction of, uh, of their previous stock exchange announcement. We should do advise that the reference to gold and silver at this prospect was included erroneously as a result of an administrative oversight. <laughs> the grades for gold and silver measured by hand and extra were included in the internal site report but were not meant to be released to the ASX. As, as a result of these intersections have not yet been received, the company wishes to retract this amount two more times. So, on the fourth, ASA has confirmed the discovery of mineralised shear hosted main structures at this particular project. Laboratory ASA has confirmed the presence of copper, zinc and silver within these zones. 2.1% copper, 63 grams per tonne silver and 3.4% zinc. No significant gold values were reported in the laboratory ASA. But the next thing I did was check out what happened at the share price as a result. <laughs> so, the initial, initial statement came here and stock price started to rise. The retraction came here and sank by 25%. And then the lab results came down here and there was a bit of a bounce, but you interpret that as you, as you please. Now, in terms of setting the final scene, my, my experience is working with people with successful experiences with XRF. Make sure you've done a lot of training, good training, quality training. Set some aims and objectives for the XRF. Be clear about its role within the organisation. Adopt fit-for-purpose methodologies. They're not that complicated. Um, replicate the protocols that you follow for samples that you send to the library. That's the easiest thing to do. Manage the data responsibly, as, as automated as you can. There's a lot of consultants uh, and service providing companies who've had a lot of experience working with XRF. Thanks very much.